fair to tell a doctoral student that you're going to spend the amount of time it's going to take to do this? I mean, earlier I heard one of my colleagues say, the best dissertation is a finished dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm concerned that we are misleading students to think that they can do this in a timely manner <coughs> instead of U.S. universities. Now, Shvanta, or you know, European model, that allows people to come in, begin, we don't worry about coursework, we get them started right away, and they're able to do these things. So I'm, I'm asking, is it fair to, to think that we can have students do this kind of work from start to finish in a timely manner? And then I want to ask also how we get colleagues across campus to think that this is research. I mean, I remember Dave Merrill once telling me he had to convince graduate school at Utah State that this actually was research yes. and it wasn't a project. Yeah. So I just posed that to everybody. I mean, I don't know the answers. I just I'll, I'll give you the short part and then turn it over to Tom. I think I think it assumes that there is a program of research going on and that a person can join it for a while and then leave that program and that in the process can do something productive that looks like a dissertation. That's, that's an option. And so what it requires of us as professors is to create research programs rather than helping students find isolated research questions. So anyway, Tom, thank you. Yeah, I, I totally concur. And I uh, just in answer to Jim's question, I can give you, I'm going to give a case study of a student who did uh, a dissertation this way, but she did it at the University of Twente. But I can give you six case studies of my students who did design-based research in a reasonable amount of time as well. But let me hit the clock here, so stay on time. Carrie, can you hear me okay? Uh, you getting the audio all right? All right, great. Uh, I, uh, this is uh, TJ, I don't know if you knew when I took this picture of you, uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, the topic is educational design research. If it's so valuable, if, if AERA is willing to give TJ and his colleagues money to bring you all here and talk about this, if it's so valuable, why is it so rare? Uh, and Jim, of course, brought up uh, maybe one of the reasons. Uh, it's perceived as just too difficult for, for people to do. I want to draw your attention to someone, uh, I think his books, Atul Gawande, He's a surgeon at Harvard Medical School. He got one of those MacArthur Genius uh, Grants and so forth. He's written three wonderful books, and I think every new doctoral student should read these. One's called Complications, one's called Better, and the most recent one's called The Checklist Manifesto. But just a couple weeks ago, he had an article in The New Yorker where he talked about fast ideas and slow ideas, and particularly within the context of medicine, but I think it has some implications for the states as, as well. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't realize you were going to have to leave the building to get me a glass of water. <laughs> Thanks, Ike. <laughs> um, so, he talked about, in uh, 1846, a dentist named Morton, working in Boston, actually uh, developed the first anesthetic. And uh, uh, it was uh, immediately successful. And he shared it with a surgeon in Boston. And they did uh, a surgery a couple days after he did the dental procedure. And this woman had a, a huge tumor removed. And after she woke up and she said, oh, she felt nothing. Uh, so they, they basically invented the field of anesthesiology. And it spread so quickly. Within two months, it was being used in London and Paris. Within two years, it was used everywhere around the world. Before they had anesthesiology, surgeons would basically do surgery as fast as possible. And they'd wear these blood-stained gowns. And the more blood and guts they had on the gowns, the better surgeon they were perceived to be because it showed that they were really fast and could do this stuff. And of course, as you might imagine, a lot of people died in that process. Uh, and they're kicking and screaming. And finally, they would faint away and so forth. Uh, in 1865, uh, Joseph Lister invented a process for controlling for bacteria antisepsis. Uh, but this idea, where you know the notion of doing surgery in a clean environment, uh, 
this idea did not take off at all. And it was uh, decades before it spread around the world. In fact, one of the U.S. presidents, James Garfield, died because of the, uh, the lack of people applying the principles that Lister had developed. James Garfield uh, was shot at Union Station in Washington, D.C. He had a very superficial wound, but his doctors started putting their dirty fingers into the back, where the, trying to find the bullet. They introduced uh, sepsis, and he, it took him 11 weeks to die. Very, very painful death before he passed away. He was literally killed by his physicians, not by the assassin. So it is, it is, yes. <laughs> I hope you all had a good breakfast. <laughs> so, uh, why is it that some ideas spread so quickly and some don't? And in fact, the sepsis thing is still a problem today in medicine. And you read every day about people getting sick because they're in the hospital. Um, and so, you know, what's the difference between anesthesiology and, you know, just washing your hands and keeping your equipment clean? Why does one idea work so well and one so slowly? Well, anesthesiology actually sh showed an immediate improvement on a very obvious problem. You got patients kicking and screaming and, uh, you know, you give them a little ether and they're out and you can work calmly and so forth. Uh, and it benefited both the patients and the physicians. It made the physician's life easier and the patients. And it was relatively easy to do. Of course, they had to work out protocols for the right amount of anesthesia and so forth. But it actually spurred a whole new field. Instead of just a surgeon in the medical uh, facility, you now had an anesthesiologist who handled all of that. Uh, but antisepsis was a, uh, a, not an obvious immediate, uh, you didn't see the immediate effects and the problem was invisible. In fact, for decades, uh, many physicians said that germ theory was totally uh, false, just like a lot of Republicans say today about evolution. No, shouldn't go there. <laughs> uh, but it benefited patients, but it inconvenienced physicians. They actually had to wash themselves in carbolic acid in the early days. It was painful. Yeah, they, they didn't like it. Uh, and it's, so it's hard. It's difficult. And even today, this is a recent study that was done in Australia. They actually asked physicians in Australia, surgeons, how often they clean their hands between procedures and patients. They reported, self-report, 92%. They had nurses observe them, and the, completion, the compliance rate was less than 8%. Less than 8%. Um, now, I would say there's a contrast here with traditional educational research. You know, traditional re research, and Andy talked a little bit about this, it's quick and controlled, little experimental study. You can get a publishable finding really rapidly. Uh, it, you can do it alone or with just one doctoral student. It, it, you, you treat your people like subjects or rats, and it's easy, and you can get lots and lots and lots of these studies done. Design-based research, on the other hand, is lo I hope you don't mind me using your picture, Brenda, <laughs> uh, is long-term. It's messy. It's more difficult to publish. It requires a team. The people you work with are called collaborators and participants. And it's hard. It's very hard. We have to admit that it's hard. But it's so much more important. Our journals, and I used to be the editor of one of these journals, I know some of you are the editors of some of these other journals, are full of pseudoscience to this day. Studies that have absolutely no impact. For example, this is the latest edition of the Australian Journal of Educational Technology. It just came out Sunday. I'm the only American member of the editorial board for this journal. I might not be after if they hear about this presentation. <laughs> um, but I looked at the first five articles in the most recent issue. And it's yet again the parade of pseudoscience that we have in our field. Okay, so we got a study of, 
you know, learning to take the tablet. We always come up with the cute little titles, how pre-service teachers use iPads and so forth. The case study of eight pre-service teachers, a typical dissertation. Interactivity with an interactive whiteboard in traditional innovative primary schools. They actually, this one, they expected the innovative schools to have more student or shared use of the interactive whiteboard. They found just the opposite. Often happens. Uh, here's two studies about wikis. Uh, you know, the, no, and again, no strong evidence of learning, more, uh, much more cooperate, uh, co uh, cooperation than collaboration. And, and the overall finding, we find it again, instructor's role is very critical, you know. Anyway, uh, <laughs> this one down here was the only experimental study. Effects of, uh, they, they were comparing videos that students made themselves with videos that were professionally made. And guess what they found? No significant differences. Uh, very predictable. This is a state of our field. No significant difference. It, it's been this way. It, well, I had five courses with Richard Clark at Syracuse, and he told us at that time, he said, why are we continuing? This was a long time ago, obviously. Uh, and uh, he said, why we continue to do research this way? And yet we do. Uh, the only defensible def rationale for design-based research, I think, is impact on real world problems. But what I'd like to challenge us to do is to change this statement to say the only defensible rationale for educational research of any kind is impact on real world problems. We cannot afford to do research that doesn't have impact. Now I want to go back to Gowande. In his uh, article in the New Yorker, he talks about he just got a $14.1 million grant from the Gates Foundation to start the Better Births Project in India. And uh, w what they find is in India is millions of babies are dying for n unnecessarily, for you know, really cultural things that literally kill children. Just like the doctors sticking their fingers in Garfield's wound kill children, people kill their children because of cultural things. So for example, a lot of children die because they simply get chilled and too cold and get pneumonia. Typically what they do in these rural areas is an infant's born, they put a little uh, cloth around it and hand it to the family. And the child gets chilled and gets sick and dies. Med good medical practice says you need to put the baby up against the mother's skin. It keeps the baby warm. Uh, they survive. Uh, that critical uh, first a few hours. Uh, it's a simple thing, but they're having to go out and go door to door and teach people this and change the behavior of nurses and, uh, and midwives and so forth. Uh, Gwande talks ab uh, about, you know, people uh, always are expecting, you know, a technological solution to these types of things. So this is a quote from the article. It says, in the era of the iPhone, Facebook, and Twitter, we've become enamored of ideas that spread as effortly as ether. And we start off talking about anesthesiology. We want frictionless, turnkey solutions to the major difficulties of the world, hunger, disease, poverty. We prefer instructional videos to teachers, drones to troops, incentives to institutions. People and institutions can feel messy and anachronistic. They introduce, as the engineers put it, uncontrolled variability. So their innovation consists of having uh, mainly women, groups of 20 women uh, and one male. It's interesting, in the article he says, the reason they use 20 women and one male, the women do the actual instruction. They need the male along to protect the women, and they need to have 20 men women to protect them from the one male. He, said, he says that in the article. Um, anyway, but in our field, we think this is the solution. You know, this was a headline uh, uh, less than a year ago, you know, a couple days after the iPad mini came out. iPad mini could spur an educational revolution. Barf, barf, barf. How many educational revolutions have we heard about? Now it's <laughs> MOOCs. You know, MOOCs are going to be the revolution. Uh, we know what works in teaching and learning. It's fundamental stuff. You know, Hattie wrote a book called Visible Learning, and he found that, uh, you know, what would you think would, would impact learning? Uh, you know, computer-based instruction, simulations, web-based learning, distance education, television? No. 
the, here's the uh, impact factors for these things. The, he, and Hattie argues, he used to be dean of the College of Education at the University of Auckland, now he's at the University of, he's at Melbourne Royal Institute of Technology. Uh, he says anything below 0.4 is meaningless. You don't want to fool with it. So look, formative evaluation to teachers, a fundamental dimension, reciprocal teaching, which is what Ann Brown worked with. Feedback to students, mastery learning, cooperative learning. These are the things that impact learning. Computer assisted instruction, simulations, web-based learning, distance education, television, my God, has a negative impact on learning. Uh, you know, we are focused on the wrong things. Now, I know many of you in this audience are saying, well, Tom, I know this. I'm, I'm with you on this. So I'm really not, you're not the proper audience for this. Maybe the people that watch the video uh, will get it. This is uh, the type of thing that Gawande is doing, where they go out and they actually, they've found that uh, in order for the people really to get it, how these uh, simple procedures should be used with child, ch uh, newborns, is they actually have them draw it out. Draw it out. Show me what you would do. They actually have to create an artificial uh, artifact, something external to themselves that shows that they've learned. Constructionism, we've heard of that. Uh, here's another innovation he talks about in the article. We've known since the 1960s that if a child has severe diarrhea, they will die. They can lose 40% of their weight in less than 24 hours. It's just amazing. It's millions of children die from this. There's a simple solution that was developed in the 60s where you take a fistful of sugar, a pinch of salt, a jug of water, you mix that and you spoon feed that to the infant and they survive. It's unbelievable. It reduced the death rate from diarrhea by 80% when they do this, and yet it hasn't spread. It ha it, and here again, they're trying through their project to spread it. Um, uh, here he's talking in the article, only a third of children in the developing world receive oral rehydration therapy. Many countries try to implement at arm's length, going low touch without sandals on the ground. It's all about sandals on the ground. And that's what design research often involves, sandals on the ground. As a recent study by the Gates Foundation, the University of Washington has documented, these countries have failed almost entirely. People talking to people is how the world standards change. That's how education is going to change. You know, it's not going to change through this, okay? Um, how many of you have seen this, okay? This is the latest handbook. Excuse me. Okay. This is our whole friggin' field. This is uh, 2014. How many of you wrote chapters in here? Show your hands. Okay. Uh, I have three of them in here. But, th you know, if we threw this over the wall of a classroom, we'd kill a kid. You know? It, but, you know, maybe a teacher could stand on it and get something off the top shelf, but it really isn't going to change, you know, practice. It's not going to change. When I came to Georgia in 1982, a senior professor who now has a, an award, he's dead now, but he has an award that they give every year named after him, said to me, young man, you need to get your hand on a set of data and publish it everywhere. He didn't say to me, young man, children in Georgia can't read. Children in Georgia can't compute. You know, he didn't say any of those things. He said, just get your hands on a set of data. And unfortunately, for many students, we're still telling them that message. So, Gawande's work is done in reference to the Millennium Development Goals, reducing child mortality being one of them. I mentioned millions of newborns perish in the first month of life, and you can see that uh, a lot of these are preventable by the things we've mentioned, like uh, infections from sepsis and and getting chilled and so forth. Um, there's a great project that comes out of University of Colorado Denver, Brent. This is called Helping Babies Breathe. And I heard this woman give a keynote, Dr. Susan Nehemiah, who's a pediatrician there at UC Denver. And uh, they used design research to build a solution to a problem. They actually developed a, uh, a simple little simulator that you fill with hot water and you use it to teach women in Bangladesh and India and so forth how to clear the ear airway when a baby 
is born and how to do infant CPR and those types of things. Very low tech type of thing. Uh, but they, you, if you read her research and heard her speak, I saw her give a keynote at a simulation conference, they did design based research. Now, I had intended to give you each a copy of this book today, <laughs> but unfortunately they haven't arrived yet. I'm hoping they're going to get here. They're supposed to be here yesterday, but uh, hopefully they'll be here tomorrow. I know some of you have it and the, a couple of you have actually read it. Um, but, you know, design-based research, uh, and I, I don't have to tell most of you in here, I've still got a few minutes, uh, <clears throat> is about working closely with practitioners to define a pedagogical outcome in creating a prototype learning environment informed by theory. You emphasize content and pedagogy more than technology, give special attention to supporting human interactions, uh, test, refine, and retest the learning environments and out until your outcome is reached and your theory is refined, and you do those simultaneously. That's what it really boils down to. A way, this is how we represent it in the book. Uh, and uh, I think Matt mentioned this last night, but we you know, go through an analysis and exploration phase, a design and construction phase, evaluation and reflection phase, all aiming toward both a mature intervention and a theoretical understanding addressing a real world problem and you're attending to implementation and spread. So how does a doctoral student do this? Well, one of the doctoral students that uh, Susan and I have worked with is Harini Raval. She was concerned with achieving universal primary education. She's from India. Here's a picture of Harini and Susan. And she got her PhD at the University of Twente. And this is her dissertation. Okay. She works with the poorest of poor children. These are children that go to no formal school. They, they uh, spend their day uh, picking through the trash and dumps or begging and those sorts of things. And they have these parateachers that a group called Pratham and some other uh, the Learning Resources Center in Pune and so forth, they grab these kids as they can and give them little lessons kind of on the fly. And uh, so her dissertation was called Supporting Parateachers in an Indian Non-Government uh, organization, the plan, reflect, and act cycle. And uh, uh, basically the problem was these teachers were ineffective. They were very teacher-centered. They were just, you know, delivering information, not really focused on learning. They didn't even have a sense of how to design a lesson for learning. Uh, it was an educational design research study led by the doctoral student and her supervisor, but involved a lot of other people as well. Major research question is what kind of professional support can help parateachers adopt teaching strategies with a learner-centered orientation? And it had dual, dual outcomes, developed a robust teacher uh, training program and enhanced theory. Um, I don't have time to go through a lot of detail. But you can see our little model up here, how we represent this, the analysis and exploration phase, uh, the design and construction phase, um, and then the uh, evaluation and reflection phase. No, notice that she ran this workshop for parateachers one time by herself. The second time she had local managers do it with her present, and the last time it was local managers alone. That's what you want to do in order to uh, do, uh, have it adopted and really used. Uh, and of course, paying attention to implementation and diffusion all along the way. It was an article-based dissertation, uh, which all of my students who have done design-based research have done article-based uh, dissertations. And uh, these are just some of the pieces that came out of the study. Uh, so another challenge I want for us to accomplish in the time we're together is you know we have these millennial development goals. My God, they're supposed to be done by 2015. They're not going to be. Uh, but we need our own development goals. We need to focus our research on important things. Maybe we could come up with the design-based research coalition. We'll call ourselves something like that. Goals, you know. And we could we you know we want to generate. I just generated a few here. But imagine if we could extend learning opportunities to all preschoolers. A Nobel Prize winning economist has demonstrated very clearly that a dollar spent on preschool education is worth a hundred dollars spent on uh, high school or, or college education. You know, we need to invest in early education. 
enhance scientific literacy around the globe, increase interest in and commitment to STEM careers among women and minorities, help high school and college students develop in the cognitive domain, uh, prepare people for the possibility of a world without work, increase commitment to a sustainable planet. These are just some of the goals that we as a collaboration or coalition could establish. I'll end with a quote from Charles DeForges, and he wrote a, a best-selling educational research textbook in the UK. He said, the status of research deemed educational would have to be judged first in terms of its discipline quality and second in terms of its impact. Poor discipline is no discipline. And I think people, many of you in the room who have done design-based research, you know that it's discipline. You know that it's rigorous. Uh, and, but excellent research without impact is not educational. And we have way too much of that in our field. So, message to the doctoral <laughs> students, don't waste your life. Don't waste your life. Do design research. Thank you. <laughs>
Tom mentioned the students should be here, and she should, but uh, we had a very limited budget. So I know, I know. That's why you're not getting paid for this keynote. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> so, um,